Today we're talking about how you can make billions by carefully watching the news for upcoming updates and what you can do to prepare for them. We'll also talk about steps you can take after a new update comes out to keep making gold as the market shifts and new items come into the game. Um, so when an update is first announced, you, you need to start trying to, to understand who will be affected by the update. Uh, take Vorkath in RS3, for example, who we all understand will be arriving in November based on the most recent quest that was released. Uh, it's content primarily for PVMers, right? We, we can kind of divide content into content that's for PVMers, for people who enjoy clue scrolls, for skillers, for questers. Uh, there, there are a variety of interests that the developers try to address at any one time when they put out new content. So since it's content for PVMers, or that we believe is for PVMers, uh, we need to understand what that means. Uh, PVMers generally need supplies, they need gear, and they need upgrades. So when we look at Vorkath in particular, um, we can actually go and reference uh, RuneScape 3 to see what or sorry, OSRS. We, we can look at Vorkath and OSRS and try and determine you know, what what is he like? You know, what, what do people need to fight Vorkath and OSRS? What do we know about Vorkath and RS3? What might be similar? What might be different? Right? We, we don't want to assume the contents can be exactly the same. Now, Vorkath was notable in OSRS because it's my understanding, at least, that um, Vorkath was the first dual type monster in OSRS. And please feel free to correct me in the comments below. Um, but he is uh, considered a dragon and a zombie for Slayer Toss. So we, some folks have a similar idea when it comes to Vorkath and RS3. And that's that he might be affected by the Dragon Slayer Codex ability as well as the Undead Slayer Codex ability. So from a merchanting or an economic standpoint, we need to start thinking about what that means. Um, it's a fairly common knowledge that a lot of players have already purchased an Undead Slayer Codex if they didn't have one, because when Necromancy came out, Raziel, you know, the most recent boss in this game, uh, he, he greatly benefited from the Undead Slayer Codex. And if players didn't have one before, they generally have one now. So the, the Undead Slayer Codex is kind of capped out on the price, probably won't see a lot more change there. Um, or the ability to make a lot of profit on those codexes. As for the Dragon Slayer Codex, we've seen a lot of change recently. Right? We can uh, go into the Grand Exchange website, look at the Dragon Slayer Codex, and we've seen that it's risen significantly over the last few months, in particular after the quest, or the most recent quest was announced. It actually rose um, you know, well over 10 mil, which is uh, pretty, pretty drastic for this item. Um, we can see also that the quantity traded has gone well outside of the historical norm, or the historical average. Um, so, as far as the Dragon Slayer Codex is concerned, I personally won't pursue it, because I know that it's already very popular, it's a little bit too late for me to want to jump on this item. Um, but with that said, it's a great opportunity to talk about more speculative, you know, long-term riskier, you know, if you have a higher risk tolerance for investing, if you have a lot more gold in the game to spend on investing, um, you know, you, you might um, try, try to buy something like the, uh, you know, Dragon Slayer Codex and still merchant it down the line. Alternatively, you, know, you, you might just buy a few and flip it in hopes that it goes up some more once the content is released. Um, and we, we saw a similar move with Praesal Codexes once Necromancy actually was released into the game. We thought Praesal Codexes had kind of capped out before Necromancy was even fully released. Turns out they didn't. They went up another, I think it was like 500 mil when Necromancy actually came into the game in full and there was an immediate need for appraisal codexes. So if you had purchased them months before and flipped them, you, know, you could sell them the week before Necromancy for several hundred mil profit, but if you sold them the week after Necromancy came out, you can make close to a billion. It was a, a very great investment. Um, 
you know, something else to think about as far as PBMers go is what kind of perks do they need? Or more specifically, what kind of perks are being recommended to them? A lot of PBMers, you know, they, they aren't going to necessarily go out of their way to do independent research, right? They're, they're going to go look at what the, the very intelligent YouTubers um, who make guides on these bosses uh, advise them to use. They're, they're going to look at the PVME Encyclopedia, a Discord which I highly recommend to everyone, regardless of your interests in RuneScape. Um, they're they're going to look at content sources like this and try and determine what is being recommended to players. So you know, to looking at PVME Encyclopedia in particular here, um, you, know, you can actually, leading up to updates, go and just search for the terms related to upcoming updates that you think might provide you with information. Um, you know, I look for Vorkath drop, you know, it gets you posts about, like, uh, high details as to Jagex, say, when Vorkath is dropping or when Vorkath is dropping. You know, folks speculate. They, they don't really have any information, but some more reliable sources or folks that we, uh, you know, assume have been watching a great deal of posts come in and also Jagex social media posts can make slightly safer guesses about um, about what might potentially drop. Um, so it's it's going to be very interesting to see what exactly Vorkath drops. Personally, I hope that there is a, a higher tier necromancy weapon, perhaps a, a two-handed weapon. I, I believe that that was hinted at at one point earlier on in the stream, if I, if I recall correctly. Um, I also remember a Jagex social media post at one point, and if someone could link that in the comments, I would really appreciate it, um, where a, a Jmod said that, you know, T95 is not the end for necromancy, right? It goes to level 120, so there is no reason for, for the T95 drops to be too rare, because that's kind of just the beginning when you think about the scale or the, the cap for this skill. Um, so with that in mind, players are going to need to augment their gear, and the PVME Encyclopedia actually um, recommends a handful of perk combinations, and I will pull it up here. Um, you know, they added a Impatient 4 Dragon Slayer combination recommendation, an Invigorating 4 Dragon Slayer combination. There is a, you know, cheap perk combination recommendation, a more expensive recommendation. Um, all of these recommendations are things that players follow. They use these reference materials to configure their gizmos, and it's possible that some of you viewers do this very same thing. And so when you go and think about it from a merchant team perspective, you know, look at the uh, the components, right? This, uh, this cheap configuration requires culinary and enhancing components. Okay, we go to the RuneScape wiki, we look at enhancing components. Those are generally from Rings of Slaying. Those aren't tradable, but they require gold bars. I'm not sure gold bars are a great thing to merchant. I, I can tell you, you know, I'm sure a lot of people already have enhancing components if they need them. I mean, we haven't really seen a price change, have we? There, there's a little bit of a change, so it's possible that purchasing some gold bars and selling them might might be a bulk move. I couldn't tell you. I haven't touched them. It could be worth exploring the margin, though. You know, look at components. Think about what people are going to make in order to get components, to get the gizmos they need to optimize killing the new content or killing the new boss or the new Slayer monster. Um, excuse me. Look at culinary components, right? Nothing here is really tradable. They're going to go to the um, the Colomancer's chest in the basement of Lumbridge Castle, and they're going to use that to get Barrow's gloves or other items that they can disassemble. So you can't really have an impact on those items or uh, make any profit from them. Now, in addition to studying gizmos that folks will put into gear, you can think future state, right? 
Um, something that I think is severely underrated is trying to think more generally about new content, what could it drop, what items could it bring to the game, and what could that uh, bring demand for. Take Morkath, for example. Is it going to drop a higher tier necromancy item? Or a two-handed necromancy item? I think so. Do we have confirmation? No. Will it probably drop some kind of combat armor or item? Probably. That, that's a, I think that's a safer guess, or a safer speculation in my mind as an experienced merchant. So what do, what do people need when they get new gear, when they get the new latest and greatest gear? They need to make new augments for it. And what are some of the most common augments that people put on gear? Well, it requires Erosian uh, Illidrunken components. I might be mispronouncing it. And those components are acquired by disassembling um, Anima Core of Sliske armor. So in that case, uh, having the uh, Crest of Zeros and dormant Anima Core armor pieces to put them into, should these item prices rise, you know, that, that could be a, a great investment. Looking forward at the future, new gear coming into the game. People are going to need to level it up to disassemble it, to get Illidrunken components, to create Aftershock, which is a highly desirable desirable augment. Um, and also, I believe, used for some armor augments as well, for the, the components. Is. Additionally, we have posts coming in on Reddit about uh, Shattered Worlds being fixed here soon so that folks can start using it again to level up uh, those very same armor pieces in the fastest uh, level zero to nine uh, invention armor leveling method that uh, was in the game that was later patched and will be brought back as per confirmation from a Jagex moderator who was posting on Reddit to get feedback and confirmation that this plan would work for the community. So we can think about, you know, what what are players going to do as new content comes out, right? They're, they're going to augment new gear. They're going to go back to old training methods that lost value when they came out. Um, they're, it's good to look forward at uh, updates and study Jagex social media posts. It's good to study discords that make widespread recommendations to the entire community and then base purchases off of that. In addition, if you're looking for safer investments, if you're not looking to speculate and to purchase things prior to content coming out, you can always be very active. The day of a new piece of content's release as well as the following week. In my experience, the most money to be made around new content is around the first one to three days. Because prices are, are the most, you know, they, they fluctuate the most then. And you have the best chance of selling items at a desirable price. It requires a lot of research, a lot of gathering information. I would never rely on street prices during that time frame. Um, but I, I think it's a good opportunity to leverage tools like uh, different price checking databases and uh, being able to uh, kind of determine, you know, what are people buying and selling? What are people making a lot of money on right now? And what new items have come into the game? Are they likely to keep going up in price or are they at their cap, you know, the first day and then they're going to go down from there? We can take Raziel for an example. The items were the most expensive for the first week. I would know. I bought the full set at five bill a piece. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful example where now those pieces are worth a couple hundred mil each. Um, but in the case of uh, what would be another good example, like Bow Last Guardian, some of those T95 weapons, buying individual pieces and then assembling the weapon to sell was very profitable for a very long time. Um, and even then, it was, uh, it was good to do that um, for... I don't know, it, it, was, it took until necromancy for that to stop being very profitable. Now we even see some players buying back other styles that they had to sell off to get the gold to purchase necromancy-related materials. Um, 
because they they worry that necromancy is going to to be nerfed or not be as competitive compared to other styles. Um, personally, I, I don't find that's the case, though I'm not a great PVMer, so I, I couldn't really tell you. Um, but I, I think it's important to keep the, the big picture in mind and kind of see where um, where PVMers are moving, you know, what are clue scrollers interested in, what new items are coming into the game, what pe what will people be using, and how much of a risk tolerance do you have as a merchant? Um, you know, if you only have a couple hundred mil or a couple bill, these kinds of investments are probably not a good idea. But if you have you know, five bill, ten bill, and you're willing to set aside thirty percent of that or one, two fourths, uh, a fourth, or a half for more speculative, forward-looking investments um, that could go from anywhere from a, a couple months to half a year, um, you you stand a chance to make significant profit, or at least I have in the past.